So, um, <clears throat> good afternoon or good morning, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Prashant Kumar, and I'm a professor and chair in Air Quality and Health and also the PI of the Reclaim Network Plus. So welcome uh, to the webinar 18, number 18. So it's a long way, uh, uh, you know, down uh, since we started. Um, and uh, uh, this is basically a partnership uh, among the five universities that includes uh, the University of Surrey, UK, CEH, University of Warwick, Bath and Bangor. So Reclaim is funded by the UKRI. So there are three councils which is funding it, which is the EPSRC, NERC and AHRC. Uh, next, please. So this is the uh, this was the team. Uh, so we, we we come from very diverse kind of background, um, you know, that links from uh, the social sciences to the ecology to the modeling and engineering. Uh, the network uh, uh, has got over 528 members and it's still growing and they're supported by our network manager and the network fellow. So this webinar series is uh, um, it is monthly. We do it first Wednesday every 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 month. Uh, it's for an hour. So usually we have two speakers. Uh, they both come from diverse backgrounds. Try to mix them up with the academic and non-academic. The whole idea is uh, um, to share the the best practices and uh, the knowledge exchange in the domain of the green and blue or grey infrastructure. So you might have seen actually, you know, the linking, uh, you know, these green blue infrastructure with the air quality, water, biodiversity, health. So there are, uh, you know, the variety of talks, uh, you know, which uh, goes on. So you might have seen the last one was the colleagues from the UKCH, and they talk about the air quality and water quality. And if you have missed that, you could see that webinar on our uh, Reclaim YouTube channel. So we'll post the link in the chat box. Um, so uh, these webinars, uh, we invite speakers. So like we have two of our speakers today, uh, I'll introduce them uh, in a while. Uh, but if you're interested to be any speaker, please let us know. So there is a form which is open on the Reclaim Network website, but you can write to any of us and we can try to look into, uh, you know, slotting you uh, into the, the future kind of webinars there. Um, so today uh, we got uh, two very interesting talks and thanks to two of our colleagues from the uh, US. I know that it's very early in the morning, so they have really taken a lot of effort to make it uh, you know, for us uh, at this slot. Um, so we, the, uh, the first of uh, the ones we come from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Dr. Richard Baldoff, and then we have Professor K. Max Chong from the Cornell University. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker in detail and I give the floor to them, I would like to uh, make a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the first of all is that, uh, um, uh, you know, please keep your microphone on mute so that uh, there is no disturbance during the, the webinars. So each of our speakers will be having 20 minutes and then you will have an opportunity to ask any questions. So please use the, use the Q&A box. Uh, you can see on your screen, write your questions, put your name and your affiliation if you want that to be read alongside your question. And my colleague, Professor uh, Lawrence Jones is here and he will be uh, uh, chairing that Q&A session and he will be picking up your questions and putting it forward to uh, our speakers today. Uh, this webinar is uh, um, recorded. And you will see the link uh, in the chat box at some point <clears throat> where you can watch the previous webinars uh, if you have missed them. And uh, uh, you can share actually the link in future, uh, you know, of this webinar in uh, in, in future as well, uh, which are usually included in our newsletters. If you are a member, then you will get the details. But we also send specific emails to promote actually this, uh, I know, this, uh, this activity. So um, without any further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, uh, who is uh, Dr. Richard Baldoff. He has over 20 years of uh, you know, experience conducting research on emissions, air quality impacts, and adverse health effects from exposure to air pollution emitted by transportation sources. Uh, his research focuses on the development of policies and the best practices to mitigate air pollution emissions and impacts at local, urban, and global scales 
He has published over 100 articles, book chapters, and he has a joint affiliation with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Office of Research and Development and the Office of Transportation and Air Quality, where he leads transdisciplinary research uh, focusing on air quality measurements, dispersion, and sustainable urban development. He also maintains adjunct professorship at North Carolina State and Texas a and Universities in the U.S. And today he will be talking about some very interesting stuff, uh, which I have a pleasure to get involved uh, with him. So Richard will tell about it. So Richard, over to you. OK, thanks so much for the uh, introduction and invitation to present this morning to, to you all, Prashant. I uh, really appreciate it. And we can go right to the next slide. And, um, you know, for the presentation today, I'll just um, provide a really quick background. I, I know a lot of people are uh, likely familiar with a lot of the background on air quality, especially like exposures near transportation sources. But I'll, I'll do a little bit of, you know, what are we concerned? Why have we really been, you know, looking into this topic of green infrastructure as a mitigation opportunity? Uh, I'll talk about some of the research that we've done here in the U.S. through the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I'll spend um, more of my time about you know, some recommendations that we're actually updating uh, that we had presented in the past. And, and again, we're, we're trying to uh, modernize a little bit and put uh, online. Uh, I'll talk a bit too about uh, co-benefits of green infrastructures and then release really what are some of our next steps. Uh, so we go to the next slide. Um, again, just very briefly, uh, the sources of air pollution. You know, we have uh, tailpipe emissions and evaporative emissions from uh, light duty passenger cars, heavy duty trucks. Um, also, though, of growing interest, uh, especially as the um, motor vehicle fleets electrify worldwide, um, you know, we still have this um, issue of break in tire wear. And that's especially been growing, you know, as as these uh, break and tire wear emissions could change with electric vehicles as well. Uh, many of those are particles, but also um, of growing concern are even some uh, gaseous releases uh, from break and tire wear. And then, of course, there's reentrained dust that's uh, settled on the road again from some of these sources as well as from other air pollution sources that can also uh, create exposures, especially to populations uh, very close to these larger transportation sources. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and again, this is just a, a review done by Carner. Uh, wow, back in 2010. However, it's still very relevant today. And uh, because of these emissions from the transportation sources, these uh, concentrations, especially of certain primarily emitted pollutants from motor vehicles, uh, they can be as much as an order of magnitude higher, especially within that first like two, three hundred meters of the facility. Um, however, it's also important to note these transportation sources can have uh, very regional, urban, and even global impacts to air quality. So again, this is one of the reasons we're very focused on uh, trying to mitigate these sources. So we can go to the next slide. And uh, this is uh, just an example, but there's really been hundreds of thousands of, of health studies uh, that have shown that people living, working, going to school near these large transportation facilities face increased risks. Um, a meta-analysis was done of literally hundreds of studies by the Health Effects Institute in the U.S. Uh, and they saw some uh, you know, significant associations between these uh, you know, transportation related exposures and adverse health effects to adults, children, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, cancer, even premature mortality were seen. And uh, they only even HEI only looked at you know certain endpoints. There's been many other studies looking at other endpoints, uh, you know, including developmental effects, uh, neurotoxicity, and even autism has been associated with uh, near road exposures. So we can go to the next slide. And especially looking at this, you know, near road, these elevated uh, concentrations, even just within the first two, 300 meters, um, you know, we consider that a, a small area. However, there's potentially large uh, population exposed 
Uh, I do have just some statistics from the U.S. here. You know, we have estimated over 50 million people living within 100 meters of a major transportation facility. Most of those are large roadways. However, that does include rail yards, airports, things like that. But again, a very large population. And again, as I just mentioned, you know, uh, some of the concerns on health effects are around children. Uh, again, in the U.S., we have over 17,000 schools that have been identified to be within 250 meters of these large transportation facilities. So, again, a very large population potentially exposed, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. These statistics are really relevant to uh, most countries throughout the world. So we can go to the next slide. And then, of course, we uh, want to look at potential climate impacts as well. Uh, transportation sources, again, worldwide are one of the leading sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is just, again, some statistics from the U.S., again, very relevant uh, worldwide as well. But we can go to the next slide. And not just the major greenhouse gases, but we also have the concern around short-lived climate pollutants, which aren't always in all the greenhouse gas inventories, especially black carbon, uh, but also methane. Again, transportation sources, uh, you know, can be major for for these pollutants as well. So again, mitigation at both uh, short-term and longer-term scales are very important. So we can go to the next slide. And so I, I always do want to talk, you know, about how we can mitigate transport sources because we do look at it like we have a number of options. Uh, of course, you know, one of the main areas is we can reduce direct vehicle emissions. Uh, we can also reduce activity through promoting public transit, walking, biking, again, even like low emission zones, uh, you know, and other approaches like that. And then we have like some urban development techniques, which, which do also encompass, you know, reducing activity as well. Uh, but, you know, one of the areas, especially we're looking at short term, is this potential use of, of green infrastructure and how that can improve um, both local, regional, and even um, global air quality. So we can go to the next slide. And so, again, just to highlight why we've really focused on this is, is again, there aren't many uh, short term mitigation options available and we you know, do need to really be looking at reducing emissions and uh, pollutant impacts, uh, both for health and climate benefits uh, in the short term. Uh, so, again, you know, doing emission reduction strategies, emission standards, they take a long time to implement fleet turnover, technology development. Uh, there's a, a lot of capital and other planning involved in some of the activity reduction, like public transit and walking, biking options, and then even some, you know, development zone, low emission zones, um, you know, buffers where we actually have development exclusion zones can be uh, difficult to implement and often have some unintended consequences, especially to areas outside uh, the focus of the, um, these zones. So, so that's again one of the reasons that we really looked at green infrastructure. So we can go to the next slide. And so again, I was just going to briefly talk about some of the research that we've done at the, the EPA. Um, but again, this is just a uh, um, kind of tip of the iceberg as far as a lot of work's been done. You know, really looking at how green infrastructure can um, affect uh, near road air quality. Uh, so this is just a study we did in North Carolina back, I believe, in about 2011, uh, where, again, we looked at concentrations both in a clearing and behind vegetation. Uh, you can kind of see in the bottom picture what the vegetation looked like. And again, concentrations, uh, the solid line was the clearing, the dotted lines are behind the vegetation. So you can see, especially in the morning when winds were a bit low, the concentrations tended to be high because of morning rush hour. Uh, concentrations greatly reduced behind the vegetation. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And we've also done a study where we've looked at, you know, long stretch of limited access highway, again, a clearing and then behind vegetation, but with vegetation with uh, very different characteristics as far as porosity, thickness, height. Um, so we really see how concentrations downwind of that vegetation can change based on the vegetation characteristics. Um, and so again, this um, graph just highlights that, you know, when we do have very thick, um, low porosity vegetation, we could see very significant reductions, especially in PM, especially 
PM number, like ultrafine particles, also reductions in black carbon, and some even for NO2 and CO. Um, but like, for example, on our site three there, um, where we had very high porosity, um, some gaps in the vegetation, uh, we saw a very either a small decrease in PM, but we could actually see an increase in uh, downwind um, gaseous pollutants concentration. So again, the characteristics of the vegetation are, are extremely important as highlighted in this study and again shown in other studies as well. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, last thing I did want to just point out is we've also done some work, you know, looking at combining uh, solid uh, structures like it can be as much as a, a noise barrier, but it could also just be a solid fence uh, with vegetation as well. So, you know, again, what we've seen is um, from some of our work, but also other studies as well, that solid like noise barriers and fencing does have an air quality benefit, especially it increases dilution essentially uh, from pollutants off the roadway. But when we add that vegetation with these solid uh, barriers, we can actually get an even more enhanced reduction. Uh, and many studies have shown the greatest reductions are actually combining the two. So you get the guaranteed dispersion from the solid fencing, but you also get some deposition and increased dispersion from vegetation as well. So we can go to the next slide. So back in 2016, uh, we actually took some of both the research that we've done, other research, including some of the researchers involved in the Reclaim Network, and we brought this together to um, develop a recommendations guide. You know, we really wanted to highlight um, the characteristics that had improvement to downwind air pollution concentrations when using vegetation. Just as much, we wanted to highlight the characteristics uh, that could create some unintended consequences and increase downwind pollutant concentrations. So, uh, we again, we tried to bring this to together in a guide, really like review some of the, the previous research and give, you know, recommendations on uh, best practices. And that is something that's still currently it's available online. It's a long link, as you can see in the slide, but uh, that li link is available and, uh, you know, people can access this guide right now. But we can go to the next slide. And again, one of the main reasons that we developed this guide is we did start to do some pilot studies in 2015, 2016 in the US. Uh, these are two of our first studies. We had a school in Oakland, California that you see on the left. Uh, then we have a, a park in Detroit, Michigan that you see on the right. And then you can see in the um, main pictures, this is what they look like when we first started the project. The bottom left is a, a similar picture from when we started, but then you can see on the bottom right uh, after some of the vegetation has been planted. So at the school, we're getting this information more on they did have a, a solid noise barrier existing, but you see just an asphalt playground uh, after that. And then you can see in the bottom right, they've planted this vegetation. So we can see that combination of the solid and vegetation and what reductions could occur, but also some of the co-benefits. They had flooding issues, uh, other water issues as well, in addition to just adding greenness to, to the school playground. And so we're evaluating that as well. And then in the park as well, the bottom left, that picture is actually taken from a baseball field, which wasn't used, obviously, you can see why. And now that same picture bottom right is from that same baseball field, now with the vegetation planted. And we've been taking measurements after the planting um, over several years. So we're trying to see how changes in downwind air quality are occurring with the growth of the vegetation. So we can go to the next slide. So as I then mentioned um, in the introduction area that we're looking to um, you know, update our guide. Um, not as much adding to additional research because a lot of the research is still being consistent from when we put together our initial guide back in 2016, but really making it a little more accessible, especially to like developers and landscape architects, but also provide a bit more information and honestly improve some of the, the graphics. We didn't really focus too much on that in our first guide. It was much more of a technical guide. So again, trying to expand uh, the capabilities. So this is just an example. Uh, we have this flow diagram, you know, we're using, we want to give some kudos to John Gallagher too from uh, Trinity College in Dublin, who was one of the inspirations behind 
uh, this idea of a, a tree as a flow diagram. Um, but again, so this is the idea of, for the website, kind of laying out this process that people can go through, actually design a potential vegetation barrier, and then be able to assess that vegetation uh, barrier. And we're actually, that's part of our collaboration with um, Dr. Max Zhang that you're going to hear about um, after my presentation, where we can have actual modeling tools to, to quantify both the potential benefits and we're hoping to also identify any areas of concern with uh, proposed planting characteristics. If we can go to the next slide. Again, just real briefly how vegetation you know, works for um, improving downwind air quality. Uh, so again, we have the emissions from the traffic. Uh, we get some dispersion from the vegetation, so we increase with the cleaner air above. But then we also get deposition onto the vegetation. We can get um, from impaction for especially coarser, larger particles, um, but then also diffusion for the very small particles. And so even for things like black carbon, as I mentioned, a short-lived climate pollutant, we can actually get um, a, a lot of deposition of those smaller particles through diffusion as well. Um, and then they should usually either washed out or they fall out onto because they can be embedded into leaf surfaces and fall out afterwards. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is just a few examples from our guide. This is actually in both our 2016 guide now, but we've used some of these still in our, um, our current updated guide. Um, and again, just highlighting some of the characteristics that can be for an effective vegetative barrier. So again, you want coverage from the ground to the top of the canopy. You want low porosity. Um, you know, you do want some so the, the airflow can go through and you can get that particle deposition, but you don't want a lot of porosity where it just slows and stagnates winds and you can get concentration buildup. So we can go to the next slide because these are highlights of this higher porosity or again, like in the top left, uh, where you have these nice shade type trees and the nice ornamental and aesthetic tree canopy. Um, however, the pollutants can go underneath, but the canopy slows wind speeds down, again, causes stagnation and concentration buildup. Um, so I, we have examples from you know, open road situations as well as even from street canyon situations. And again, I know a lot of work, especially in street canyons, it's been done by the Reclaim Network group too. And so we've used that a lot in our street canyon guidance. So we can go to the next slide. And then, as I mentioned, combining solid and vegetation has often been shown to be the most effective for improving downwind air quality. And so, again, just a couple examples, including at the bottom, uh, you know, one concern that a lot of, especially like schools and residential areas, have the concern that if we put these really thick vegetation or solid, you know, fencing and vegetation, that that there's no visibility from the road and there's a safety concern. So there's even been some, you know, work done about with clear barriers, so you can still see behind the barrier and don't have as much of those safety concerns. And so that's a another thing to consider if that is an issue that that's come up for for folks. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, these are just some conceptual ideas too, taken from our, our updated guide. Again, just highlighting how you know, we could have, again, in open road conditions, how you can improve it with either vegetation alone or combining solid and uh, solid barriers and vegetation. We can go to the next slide. And again, while street canyons aren't quite as common in the U.S., they are, you know, increasing actually. But you know, we also want this to be relevant um, worldwide. Uh, so we do again have um, some discussion and, and um, you know, do talk about recommendations for street canyons, which can be different from open road uh, conditions. And so we really try to highlight that. Try to highlight, um, you know, what different street canyon orientations are and when best to implement. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, just real briefly, we also do talk in the, the guidance about, you know, other rec considerations, vegetation characteristics, the, again, the physical, you know, what types of trees most likely will allow for both um, impaction, diffusion of the, the, the uh, air pollutants onto the vegetation and, you know, increase removals, but also then also, you know, being, um, handling the burden of being near these transportation sources and other things like that. So we can go to the next slide. 
and again, just we also try to align our recommendations with our U.S. Forest Service iTree model. So this allows for a selection of tr adequate tree species, both for removal of pollutants, but again, to handle burdens of being near roads and other you know, characteristics that are that are very important to planting in this kind of environment. So we can go to the next slide. And then just briefly, I'll just finish up, you know, again, talking about some of the co-benefits, you know, one of especially important is urban cooling these days, as we're seeing this increase in uh, temperatures from, from climate change. But as I mentioned earlier, shade trees are, are not always the best for air quality improvement. And so we're looking at this guide, we're, we're really trying to balance these two and how can we actually put them the two together, maybe by combining some hedges to have some air quality benefit with shade trees uh, to provide that, that shading and urban cooling. And then we can go to the next slide. And the, the last topic is again combining also with water. And we can combine all three together too. But this is just a conceptual idea of combining some water quality uh, benefits of green infrastructure with air quality. And especially again, as concerns around um, the like break in tire wear, especially certain compounds now in tire wear, like 6PPD, metals, other things that are seen for aquatic toxicity, but they can be transported through the air. So how can we combine this mitigation option to first collect these particles from the air and then treat at the roadside along with any roadway, um, you know, surface water runoff as well. So this is another area that we're really trying to focus on and provide these recommendations. So we can go to the next slide and this should really finish up. Uh, first, yeah, I do want to acknowledge everyone who's been involved. Uh, again, as Prashant, uh, John Gallagher and Max too has uh, been especially important colleagues in our uh, development of these uh, resources and, and guides over the years. Uh, and then I just want to do the last slide real quick. Um, just some of our next steps. And as I mentioned that, you know, we're looking to update the guide put it online um, and then integrate it with the, the modeling that Max is going to talk about as well. But I just, just want to open up that, you know, we're definitely interested in any comments, uh, folks that are interested in seeing our drafts right now that might want to comment on them and provide, you know, some how useful they are, any kind of recommendations for improvements in our online guide as well. So with that, um, finished up and so I look forward to uh, you know, answering any uh, questions that come up at the end and I turn it over to Prashant. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much Richard. Yeah. I think this is a brilliant uh, presentation and uh, um, you can, we can see the the wealth of you know the the knowledge uh, you have you know accumulated over the studies and the most important part is the how to convert actually this this science into policy and action. So this guide is something which I think would be quite interesting, and I'm sure that the colleagues would look forward to, uh, you know, to see more about that. Um, if you have any questions for Richard, please use Q&A box and write your question with your name and affiliation if you want that to be read. So um, we'll pick all these questions after the next presentation. So I have a pleasure of uh, uh, inviting <coughs> Professor Max Jang. Uh, who is the Irwin Porter, Porter Church Professor of Engineering at Sibley School of Mechanical Engineering and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the Cornell University in the US. He currently serves as the Kathy Dower Marble and Kurt Marble Faculty Director at the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. Dr. Jong's research has resided on the nexus of energy and environmental systems in the ring, driven by social impact, focusing on air pollution mitigation, renewable energy, and building systems. So um, you will hear from Max, uh, who has done a fantastic job in the green infrastructure, you know, the domain. So over to you, Max. Great, right, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. All right, thanks. Um, you know, thank for introduction. Uh, also, you know, thank for Rich uh, uh, for providing all the all the background informations and uh, the latest uh, development. You know, this also uh, you know the work I'm presenting here also in close uh, in close collaboration with Richard's uh, Rich uh, group at EPA. Um, few folks who acknowledge some of the former uh, former students. 
uh, in my group who contributed the work. Also, a lot of in, uh, valuable discussion with the David Heiss, EPA, and the uh, Preek uh, at ERG, uh, you know, as well as John Gallagher at the Trinity College. Uh, the funding uh, supported by the National Science Foundation, also the EPA. Um, so, like I said, I'll go, you know, because I had the advantage of uh, having Rich presenting before me, so I go directly to uh, the science part of it. Um, so, um, you know, we call the science-driven green infrastructure design. Uh, so the idea here is, as Rich uh, mentioned here, uh, when the plume goes through a vegetation, uh, then you have the enhanced uh, deposition. Uh, but also, uh, the vertical mixing also be in, uh, increased, right? Uh, so essentially, we can manipulate the turbulence, right? So by different design options, right? So so that's to achieve uh, the benefits and also minimize. Uh, the disbalance in terms of the air pollution. And so also for my research, I, you know, because, you know, we are, we call ourselves impact driven, right? So we care a whole lot about how the, those ideas the, 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 from the research can be implemented, right? Uh, in the real world and by the communities, right? So then one sort of principles I, I think is uh, cost effectiveness, right? So whatever we present uh, to the community, you know, had to be, you know, come at reasonable cost, right? So, um, you know, which are hopefully self-evident, uh, but I'll talk about some implications. Um, you know, another idea, you know, another principle I think is also important is to do no harm, right? So, as well as we try to uh, to uh, create the benefits, right, through design. But you know, hopefully, we're not gonna, you know, you know, mess and you know, try to uh, address one problem by creating another problem. Right? So, so that's I think the do no harm principle also important in this domain, right? So uh, altogether, we we are we are thinking there are some for it's a site uh, dependent right but i think for uh, any uh, individual scenario there are going to be some kind of optimal design that's what that we are uh, aiming at um so the work i want to present here is the you know following those principles uh so what we're doing essentially summarizing this diagram right so um uh, for a lot of work, we have been creating CFD-based modeling tool uh, to evaluate the green infrastructure design, right? Which we can, you know, we can evaluate the existing design, but also uh, come up with some uh, new design or novel design options, right? So this is one set of work. The other set of work, though, is um, by having sort of uh, high fidelity CFD uh, model or CID simulations, which also can help us to create other tools that's not as computationally uh, expensive as a CFD model, the computational fluid dynamic model, which is quite, you know, uh, quite resource intensive, right? So uh, I will talk about the two ideas. Uh, one is uh, through the, the machine learning approach. Uh, the other to the more conventional uh, Gaussian-based equations, but how to come up with some new idea in our domain of work, right? Uh, but all those all those efforts gonna you know hopefully lead to uh, contribute to the guideline uh, that's uh, Rich uh, just presented. Right? So I'll wish to talk about the. You know some some ideas. You know some of the idea on the uh, sort of uh, hopefully novel design ideas, and then I'll go through uh, go to the uh, the machine learning and Gaussian uh, approach. Uh, so one of the ideas we this is a while well go. I think also mentioned in rich um, uh, presentations. So we are looking at sort of two. This is our early uh, earlier 
uh, effort, right? We are looking at a uh, viable design. One is uh, a wide vegetation, right? With a, you know, essentially wide and dense right? vegetations. The other one is uh, vegetation and solid barrier or some barrier combination, right? Uh, you know, if you go back, if we go back to follow uh, I presented earlier, essentially, so both options uh, promotes uh, promotes vertical mixing, right? Also enhance the deposition. So this is from early work. Uh, but then, you know, once again, right? From the cost effectiveness, um, there are challenges, right? So more tree, you know, denser tree, I mean, there's going to incur higher cost, right? And uh, for some wall, you know, some wall better solve is not is not in not uh, at, come at a low cost on neither, right? Uh, but also had the limitation can be only done by the Department of Transportation, at least in, in the U.S. Uh, policy scenario. So, uh, so some of our, our uh, additional work, uh, newer work, basically, you know, motivated by uh, this is, you know, comp combination of solid barrier and vegetation barriers, but at the same time, it's costly, right? The question is, can we use just a cheaper solid barrier to achieve same effectiveness right so that's the idea so when you know we we call the less uh low cost impermeable solid structures right so probably actually we are seeing uh in many scenarios right you in, in the real world right so in just in uh, uh in a, a slightly different context whether we can take advantage of those right so the approach we're doing here is through the, uh, you know, running the savvy simulation. You know, for example, here we're looking at uh, no barriers cases, right? Look at both the uh, velocity and the uh, turbulent kinetic, kinetic uh, energy, right? Uh, you know, as you can tell, right? When there's no barrier, there's really nothing really happening, right? Uh, but once you add the vegetation, you start seeing this so-called recirculation, right? Because uh, uh, the barrier effects. And uh, because of that, you know, if you look at a concentration profile, this is a vertical uh, concentration profile, y-axis represent height, uh, x-axis represent concentration. You know, can see here uh, having this dense uh, vegetation cause the lower ground level concentration, but also higher uh, concentration on the uh, at higher at, you know higher elevation because of the uh, enhanced the vertical uh, vertical mixing right so now if we adding a a a low cost uh, solid barrier like our fence right um, then essentially you are have two recirculation one uh, region one is by vegetation other by the solid barrier and then we look at the same graph here and you can see for the reduction on the ground level concentration, but also uh, higher concentration at higher uh, at higher you know elevation because of the uh, enhanced the vertical mixing. Right? Um, so you know similar idea here is we look at uh, how the effect by size dependence of those reductions, right? If we look at the uh, hundreds of nanometer, which is have relative small <coughs> velocity, you can see this benefit. Uh, oh. <laughs> but once you look at an even smaller, like a you know, a nanoside particle with much higher depth and velocity, you can see much higher. You know, you can see the deposition adding additional benefit. Right? Um, so one of the you know several quick uh, recommendation here is that. Uh, combine those, you know, lower uh, low cost, low cost impermeable solid uh, solid structure and vegetation is more effective than, you know, less and uh, vegetation alone, right? So, uh, combining a less a less dense vegetation and the less, right, can be effective as dense. You know, this is where the cost effectiveness comes from, right? So instead of you go for very dense vegetation, uh, now you can have a le less dense but a plus a solid barrier. And um, also, uh, with a you know solid solid structure, you can mitigate some of the negative effect of vegetation barrier. 
uh, and uh, uh, of course, the higher uh, the solid structure, the better, right? So this is uh, one of the uh, one sample, right, of the work we're looking at uh, how we can come up with novel, a newer design, right, uh, using the safety tool. So now we're moving to uh, how can you use the safety tool to help us to create community-friendly, less resources intensive tools. Uh, so one is through the, the machine learning approach, right? So, you know, uh, because the time here, I'm not going to go through uh, detail, uh, detail description, but uh, this is, I would say, uh, a more typical machine learning approach, right? Used to find the data, right? To try to, to, uh, to generate model and features, and then you, you train a model and you better model, right? Uh, I think one of the key uh, question here is what kind of features, right? For the machine learning approach, you can typically need to have features and data, right? So what kind of feature we need to create? Um, so this actually takes some efforts. We compare uh, the different feature, but also the feature can be collected in the real world, right? Uh, so those are the feature we come up with. Um, the velocity, the leaf area index, the vegetation, the, the width, the heights, and of course the particle size. Right? Uh, and uh, our general approach is we uh, use the CFD tools, right? We have we evaluate against the field data, and we uh, this is actually a large edge simulation tool. So that uh, at the time we uh, we only uh, we created seven five cases and use some of them for training and some of them for testing, right? Uh, so those are the combination of the different cases. Um, you know, once again, uh, I will jump to the results here. Uh, this is a better graph here. So on the left here, on the left hand side, we're looking at uh, basically one of the one of the metrics R square. Right? Uh, look at uh, so on the x axis, this is y axis R square uh, value. On the x axis. Is particle size, right? And uh, we're looking at the basic size dependent uh, performance of this model. Uh, you know, the different patterns uh, represent different uh, machine learning models. Uh, I can tell here, uh, I think for the XGBoost and then uh, neural network, they perform generally well. And uh, so on the right here, what I, hopefully you guys see my cursor, uh, so essentially, we are comparing uh, the gradients, right, or concentration uh, from the edge of the highway to uh, further down, further down road, and compare uh, the CID simulation and the machine learning model, right? Uh, you probably can, couldn't tell from this one because uh, the CID simulation and machine learning model basically over uh, on top of each other, right? And from this one, uh, you can see that the difference, uh, right? You can tell the two two lines, uh, but they are reasonable close together. So back to the resource inten in intensity, right? So for running one design cases, the design case, right? For the CFD simulation, uh, generally take about 12 hours uh, using, you know, uh, over 20 cores. Uh, but if once you train the model, right? Of course, uh, the training of the machine learning model take time, right? Uh, but once the model train and you just run it, right? It really just took, you know, take a a fraction of a second, right? So on a you know on a single core machine, which which is perfectly fine. So which enable us actually? Um, I don't have time to do the live, uh, you know, show and tell. Uh, but essentially, if you to go to green. Dot me dot cornell dot edu. Uh, so we have we actually can uh, host this model, the trained model, right, uh, on the internet, on the on the web, right. On uh, you know this is this website only a proper concept, but it does show, uh, you know, by you know allow user to choose different parameters and wait the model can return uh, with optimized, you know, with the uh, optimized. Uh, Configuration, right? All right. Um, so this is machine learning approach. Uh, the other one is uh, Gaussian based equation. You know, which is 
uh, a general framework for most of the regulatory models, right? I think both in UK and and uh, and uh, and the uh, US, right? Uh, but the challenge here is the Gaussian-based model, uh, you know, with a number of assumptions, they do not, they uh, it does not directly, you know, apply. Uh, to the situation, you know, to the vegetation, rules of vegetation environment, right? Um, so, and in addition to that, uh, the Gaussian the Gaussian model does not uh, account for deposition either, which is actually quite important, right? So, what we come up with, we call a multi region approach, right? So, essentially, based on our understanding of the the uh, flow patterns, right? We divide this, uh, the downwind, right? Uh, you know, over the, you know, uh, canopy into four uh, regimes. Uh, the first one called a vegetation region, so this is the canopy, and second one is the wake room, and third one is transition, uh, the, the fourth one is recovery, right? Uh, so the idea here, you know, actually we are using the same set up CID simulation as I just mentioned for the machine learning approach and use for this Gaussian based modeling as well. Right. So it's the same training data, right? And uh, we train two different models, one is machine learning model, one is the Gaussian based model, and then um, we test on the same cases too. Um, so for the second time I probably had uh, we're not able to go through very detail uh, essentially for any Gaussian model, right? You can see here there are some key parameters, right? Essentially, how we can come with the parameterization of the key parameters in the four different regimes uh, I just mentioned, but also ensure there's a, a smooth transition from one region to another one, right? So we don't want to have, have like a gap, right, uh, between the different uh, between the different regime. Um, so this is the uh, procedure. Um, one trick we we figure out uh, how to represent the depositions uh, in the Gaussian based model is to change the source strings, right? So, which is uh, the term A, right? So in Gaussian equation, uh, uh, so that's enable us to account for the deposition effects, right? Um, uh, just quickly, this is just compare how well those parameterized model compared to the uh, the CIP or large edge large edge simulation result, right? So, in you know once again, if you look at those uh, metrics, right, it's well within acceptable range, right? Uh, and uh, this is another uh, view. Look at uh, R square and uh, fractional bias and the normalized mean mean error. Right? Uh, as you recall, right, so we got a pretty good performance from the machine learning approach, right? And uh, especially for the smaller side where deposition is much stronger, right? So say, you know, from the, the, the Gaussian based model actually performed not as well as machine learning approach, right? So, but at the same time, right, uh, machine learning approach is a non transparent, right? It's a uh, the model itself is the black box model, right? Uh, but for Gaussian based model, is uh, it's transparent, right? So we can write down the, exactly the equations right, we use for the prime relation. So there's there's a pro and cons for both approach, right? So I think for you know if we are aiming at the future regulatory uh, purpose for the model, I think uh, my understanding is in the United States we almost require this open source. Transparent model, not the black source model, you know, a black box model. Um, I think this is the last slide. Uh, so basically, you know, once again, uh, this is a summary of our approach, uh, and there's some references, and uh, hopefully, we'll entertain your questions. Thank you. Very much, Max. Uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Lawrence uh, for the Q&A session. OK, so thank you, Richard and Max, for those very interesting talks. Just a, a 
observation to those listening. So if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll start off actually with a, a question to both of you. Um, so very interesting that you've both been looking at barriers in different ways. I was wondering if you'd spent, so you didn't really go into this in the findings, but I was wondering if you'd spent any time looking at different permeability levels of barriers. So I'm wondering if you might get, you know, you might you might get slightly higher concentrations with a semi-permeable barrier, but the the kind of width of the 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 wake effect might be larger because you're getting some airflow through the barrier. So I was wondering if you'd kind of explored that at all. Oh hi, Lauren. Um, so maybe I jump that in your question. So <laughs> yeah, sure. you are you are asking for semi transparent. You are yeah, a semi permeable barrier. So you're going to get some some airflow through it, but it's going to mm -hmm. obviously reduce the velocity, and so you're going to get some particles filtered out through the barrier. Right, right. So so I'm wondering if you know the benefits of having a wider wake effect because presumably that would lead to lead to a larger wake so you'll protect a bigger area downwind in terms of physical distance but you might get slightly higher pollution concentrations within it so i was just wondering if right I'm, i may be misinterpreting i'll just be interested in your thoughts on that um i think both reason i can you know actually look uh look at this questions uh, uh, I want to make sure we have same understanding uh, by semi uh, permeable, you know, for example, uh, I think it's very similar to the scenario we look at like, uh, you know, sparse trees, right? Uh, you know, instead of very dense wide trees, you have you know, sparse and thinner trees, right? Yeah. Um, or, or maybe a hedge that's not very dense and there's some airflow right. through the hedge perhaps. I don't think we haven't looked at a head uh, like a you know uh, sparse head yet, but uh, we does I think uh, I think Rich Group conducts some field experiments. We we did some simulations um, on the sparse trees, right? So we find out you know at least current finding is that uh, often time it lead to a higher concentration uh, at you know behind the uh, behind the barrier, right? Because the you know, slow down of the flow, you know, you turn to accumulate mm -hmm. uh, the pollutant. Uh, so I don't know, Rich, you have? Yeah, that's kind of what I would say. Like, we haven't looked at that in particular, you know, maybe there's differences in even just what's commercially available here. Like, we don't really have a lot of what we'd say, um, you know, permeable barriers or, you know, permeable, like, fencing or solid structures too much widely available outside unless it's very permeable like a what we call a chain link fence or something like that so we really haven't looked at that but like i would just agree with max you know i think we would look to our um, evaluations of different porosities in vegetation and how those porosities affect and then compare that with the permeability of a solid structure and Mm -hmm. kind of make some ways it's conjecture but assume that that you know would kind of behave the same way um, mm -hmm. but again i would say too like you talked about you know changing the wake effect and how the concentration gradient is going to change downwind you know that's part of why we're looking to put like an online evaluation tool together so somebody could actually look at a development site and do that kind of modeling so obviously if we have people that are going to be exposed just tens to 15 meters from the source, then we want to have that reduction as much as possible. And we'd probably, you know, definitely suggest, you know, not having any kind of permeability, get as much reduction as possible at that, you know, really sharp gradient point. However, yeah, maybe if development won't occur within that, there won't be exposures occurring, then we kind of consider something, you know, like the permeability affecting you know, the, the wake length and things like that. So I think that would be kind of a site specific thing that we would deal with. But again, like the use our information from the vegetation to inform what a solid structure or permeable solid structure would, would have in fact. Yeah, OK, thank you very much. Um, again, just please put some questions in either chat or Q&A. 
Um, I've got a, another question for Richard actually. So you mentioned lots of looking at lots of co-benefits and that fits really well with the with the aims of reclaim actually is to understand not just the main function for which some sort of intervention is designed but to look at the co-benefits and actually to be able to quantify those so i was just wondering what stage you were in being able to re report some early findings perhaps or is that is that co-benefit study still ongoing yeah, that's actually ongoing. Um, so again, right now, a lot of our co-benefit work has been um, uh, spurred by this, you know, concern, especially, you know, increasing, you know, potential tire and, you know, changes in brake wear and things like that with fleet electrification. Uh, so we're really just starting to explore that beyond, you know, conceptual. So like we have kind of explored it conceptually, you know, how can we maybe link some of our stormwater management models, some of our cooling models with our air quality models. But yeah, to this point, it's 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 pretty conceptual, but we're just starting now to explore some potential, you know, pilot studies and actual applications in the US at least. So so if anybody has, you know, something that they're interested in that they're looking in and you know, we could, you know, share experiences or, you know, least you know we've kind of come up with conceptually so far we'd definitely be interested in those kind of discussions thank you um yeah we just in my in my team we do some work on noise mitigation and noise mitigation modeling so it'd be interesting to i mean very clear uh, co-benefits there but right the, the wider ones with water you know water retention that's also very interesting yeah, that's it. I didn't really mention explicitly noise. Like we are doing some noise uh, associated with our study in Detroit. Um, so we are looking at that co-benefit, but like you said, that's very tightly related to. So it's definitely of interest. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't seem to have any other questions. So, and we're nearing the end of the, the hour. So I think I'll pass back to Prashant now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, both uh, for the fantastic presentations and they go very well. Uh, Richard is starting with the policy side of things and uh, Max explaining the science behind it. Um, so I think um, before I close, I would like to, uh, you know, thank again uh, our both the speakers as well as the, the chair. Uh, but also uh, could introduce actually to our next webinar, uh, which is going to be on 6th of December. And this time we got uh, uh, two you know, speakers. The one is coming from University of Bio Bio in Chile. And uh, you will hear about uh, the landscape conservation strategies. And then uh, there is a researcher from uh, our team, Dr. Abhijit, and he will be talking about the Co-Green project, which has been funded uh, from the Reclaim Network. Uh, if you're not a member of the network, uh, you could uh, um, uh, you know, join the network by going on to the Reclaim Network website. So this is reclaim-network.org. Uh, you will see the link there. Uh, if you are on uh, the X or Twitter, <clears throat> or on LinkedIn, you could follow uh, for the uh, latest updates as well. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, uh, so you will be able to hear, um, you will be able to listen uh, you know, later on or share with colleagues. Um, if you are a member, you will receive uh, those emails with the links. Uh, if you want any you know, the further information, just write to us on um, info at reclaim network.org or any of the Reclaim team members and we will come back to you. So yeah, thank you very much again for your time and uh, uh, making, um, you know, to this webinar, especially our colleagues from US. I know this early in the morning. Um, this has been fascinating presentation. So thank you very much for sharing all this uh, uh, with us. Thank you. Bye.